There are two particular fairly common experiences, two particular situations that happen with a certain amount of regularity, and that when you're in either of those two situations, you are in a moment of great spiritual danger and a moment of great spiritual opportunity. There are tests. Now, you get to verse 9, 10, 11, and 12, and there's two situations brought before us and they're juxtaposed deliberately. They seem actually like they don't, they don't belong together, but they're juxtaposed. In verse 9 and 10, we have the experience of prosperity. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, and your barns then will be filled overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, if we just had these two verses sitting there as they are, it sure looks like it's saying that if you honor God, if you have a good relationship with God and so on, you'll have a prosperous life. Isn't that what it looks like? Honor the Lord with your wealth, and your barns will be filled with overflowing, your vats will brim over with new wine. But then deliberately, verse 11 and 12 seems to be a complete non sequitur, uh, something that seems to, there's a complete disconnect. Suddenly it talks about something completely different. It says, And my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son, he delights in. I mean, discipline is pain. And this does not say that God allows pain into the lives of some people. It doesn't say some he loves receive this pain. It says those he loves. That's Verse 9, 10, 11, and 12 are deliberately putting in front of you this fact that no matter who you are, even if you are as close to God as you possibly can be, you will experience prosperity, adversity, success, suffering, everything going your way, nothing going your way. Now, most of the time, we don't experience a great deal of either. There's a kind of balance going on. But we will have times of great success. We'll have times of great suffering. We'll have times everything going our way. We'll have times which nothing seems to be going our way. And those are the two moments of test. There is nothing more spiritually dangerous than to be succeeding. There's nothing more spiritually dangerous than to be suffering. There's nothing more spiritually dangerous than prosperity and than adversity because those two experiences bring out stuff in your heart that you did not know was there. There's bad stuff in your heart that you don't believe is there. You don't expect to be there. You deny that it's there. But those two situations bring them out. If you are a wise, unselfish person, prosperity will make you more wise and unselfish. But if you are a foolish, selfish person, the worst thing that can happen to you is that you get all your dreams coming true. The worst thing that can happen to you is success because it will just simply confirm you in your path. The worst thing God can possibly do to you if you are a selfish person is let you have a good life. Nothing worse than that. Do you know what happens when success begins to happen to you? The first thing that happens is you take credit for it. You start doing well financially. You start doing well in love. You start doing well and things are going well. And the first thing you do deep inside is you start to say, yeah, because, you know, somebody says, oh, you were brilliant. And you say, no, 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 no. But inside you're saying, yeah. <laughs> I, re- I am smarter than other people. I am harder working than other people. I am wa- I'm, s- I'm more savvy than other people. You take credit for it. It's a frog in the kettle thing. It's a very, very, very slow thing. But do you know what, what this means? Have you not seen ex- what happens to extremely wealthy people? They make a billion dollars in widgets. They know all about widgets, and they probably know a lot about investing, but they make a billion dollars in widgets. They know all about widgets, and yet you very often find that they think they know about everything. Because they made a billion dollars in widgets, they feel like they know more than the psychiatrist about therapy. They feel they know more about the minister, about theology. They feel they know more about everybody than everybody. Why? Because they've been telling themselves how great they are for such a long time, and it's very, very, very slow. Eventually, they trust their insights, they trust their hunches, they trust their views way too much because they've been successful with it, but they've become fools because anyone who's wise in his own eyes or wise in her own eyes, according to the book of Proverbs, is a fool. Slowly, as time goes on, as you become more and more willing to take credit for it, something goes wrong deep down inside. And you start to be able to be cruel. You start to be able to be haughty. You start to be able to be arrogant. And yet it's it's very, very gradual. You start to become capable of doing things that you never thought you would have been capable of. And maybe to your shock, 
you say, oh my gosh, I didn't think I could do such a thing like that. But what most people do is they rationalize it, and so they go on down the, the path. Adversity shows, reveals the foundations of your life. It reveals who you are. When things go wrong for you, and you just start to fall apart, you can see the weakness of your heart. You can see your anxiety. You can see your, uh, your, your anger. You can see your selfishness. You can see your pride. Can't you see it? Adversity and prosperity will bring out the worst in you. It'll bring out the ego. It'll bring out the self-centeredness. And the worst thing you can do is rationalize it. And therefore, success screams at you, you need God. And adversity screams at you, you need God. Adversity and prosperity scream at you, here is the way to wisdom. Will you hear it or will you just hunker down? Will you despise it? Will you neglect it? Will you rationalize it? The two principles are you have to humble yourself out of the spiritual danger of success, but you have to affirm yourself out of the spiritual danger of suffering with the gospel. Well, here's how you do it. First of all, when you go into uh, success, red alert. Immediately, we're told, honor the Lord with your wealth. It doesn't say honor yourself with your wealth. When the wealth starts coming in, make sure you admit that it's not you. Don't take credit for it in your heart. Don't take credit for it at all. Red alert. Don't get that process started that can take you down the paths we were talking about tonight. Now, the way you do that is you use the gospel. And it's actually quite, quite, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's quite strong medicine. Listen, here's what the gospel says. I don't care how much the world sucks up to you. I don't care how beautiful you are. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care what your credentials. I don't care your resume. I don't care what your accomplishments. You are a sinner before God, and you are lost without the grace of Jesus Christ. And you are, in God's sight, absolutely no better than, than, than uh, anyone else in this world. No matter how ragged, no matter how degraded, no matter what a failure, you're no different when it comes before the, before the throne of God. No different at all. Do you believe that? Use that on yourself. That's what it says. Use that on yourself. It's your only hope. So you have to humble yourself in the spiritual danger of success in order to become wise. And when suffering happens, you get mad at God. Or you feel like you're not living up, so you're down at yourself. You're humble but not bold and confident. And when suffering happens, you get mad at you. You feel like you're a failure. Something has gone wrong with you. You're just nothing. But what if you believe the gospel? And the gospel is that I am wicked and yet loved. I'm not saved because I'm a good person. I'm saved because of what Jesus has done, which means that right now I am very flawed and I'm very uh, uh, messed up in many ways, and yet I'm completely loved, which means, and when I am in adversity, I can remind myself of the affirmation of the gospel. Here we see that in verses uh, 11 and 12. My son... Do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Ah, well, here's a little bit on this. You have got, this says, when everything's going wrong, to not let your suffering knock you off of your certainty that God loves you. Absolute certainty that God loves you or your suffering will go bad in your soul. It will putrefy. Now, how do we do that? Well, first of all, we're told here, you have to understand that the Bible says if you have a relationship with God, then the bad things that come into your life are discipline. Now, is you actually don't want to discipline a child. In the Bible, the word discipline is never, ever, ever used to mean punishment. It's never used, for example, when God punishes the nations for their violence. Never, ever never says that God disciplines them. It's very interesting. It's a, it's a Hebrew word that really means pain for the sake of the person. Just enough pain, not to pay them for their sins. That's not the point. The whole point of it is enough pain to make the person a better person. God is a perfect parent. And you, if you have a love relationship with him, have to live in this knowledge. We live in a world that's broken. There's all kinds of bad things happening to everybody. Because we live in a world that is broken by evil and sin. Someday God's going to fix it. But for now, there's disaster, there's sickness, there's disease, there's death. There's all kinds of suffering. And everyone is involved in suffering. But we're told this. If you create, through faith in Jesus Christ, a love relationship with God, God arranges your suffering so that it's disciplined. Do you hear me? 
He said, you're going to have suffering, but he's going to arrange the suffering so that nothing comes into your life except that which is for you. You need to be humbled. You need to learn wisdom. You need to know. Uh, if there's all sorts of things that you'll never learn, never learn about yourself. You'll never be wise without this. And God says, I want you to realize that anything bad that comes into your life is through my arrangement because I love you. I love you. I delight in you. Well, somebody says, how do I know God really loves me? And this is only discipline and not punishment. I'll tell you why. Because Jesus Christ came into this world and passed these tests for us. He was the most successful person ever, but he didn't let it go to his head. And he suffered horribly, but he trusted his father in it. And you see, Jesus was the one son who didn't need punishment or discipline, did he? He was perfect, so he didn't need discipline. And he didn't sin, so he didn't need punishment. But he took our punishment, the punishment we deserve, so you can know that whatever comes into your life is only loving, fatherly discipline. Because he delights in you. That's why the tests work. That's how you can pass the tests. By trusting in the one who passed the tests for you, so that through him you can begin to let these things turn you into someone who is wise.